We know God loves His creation, but are you sincere and faithful toward Him? Does your conduct reflect His blessings and saving grace? Or are you simply going through the motions of a worship routine that is familiar to you? Today, His Eminence Bishop Omega answers these questions and more in a sermon titled, God is Impartial in Saving and Judgment. Peace be unto you, saints, and praise the Lord. Today's sermon brings me to a very interesting place because, you know, our recent sermons, and I hope and pray all are encouraging, but have been, our recent sermons have been to uplift you, and this is too, but this one is also has an ominous warning, if you will, associated with it. This is a sermon that should awaken all of us, believers and non-believers, but today especially for believers, we should be awakened because we're going to deal with a situation, and we're in the book of Amos today, where the Lord was dealing with his people. Now, just for historical uh, background, understand that Israel was considered God's people. And the reason I say that is because even in, in the book of Amos, God says, of all the peoples on the, on the planet, I came to you. So anyone that has considered God's people, this message is to you today. And in the book of Amos, we're dealing with a situation where, as you may be aware, the kingdom of Israel as a whole was divided after Solomon's death. Between Rehoboam and Jeroboam, they divided the, the, the kingdom. Ten tribes stayed to the north, otherwise known as Israel. And the two tribes of the southern region were known as Judah. And Solomon sons only got, Solomon's descendants tended to rule Judah, while Jeroboam's uh, descendants ruled the northern kingdom. And let's just be very clear. All of the kingdom, both Israel and Judah, was known once as Israel, but after Solomon divided, but they're all considered God's people. Now, here's the problem. God's people went wrong. God's people lost their focus and their uh, uh, devotion to God. And so God sent prophets to warn them and correct them. And God was patient for many, many years with his people. Now, this history has to come out because in the Bible you're going to see Israel and Judah and Israel. How does that apply to us today? Today, we Christians are God's people. So the, the warning is relevant to any of God's people at any time that we should always remember the Lord, don't turn from Him, and if you do turn from Him and neglect Him, turn back to Him. So I want to thank God that one thing this virus has done, this COVID, has, has turned people who has back to God who have not been to, to the Lord for quite some time. For instance, we have information where people who consider themselves members of this church are now tuning in to this buzz, receiving the word, and claiming and their affiliation and membership in this particular organization. They're turning to God. So that's the whole purpose of what today's message is, that we should rethink and turn to God, even those who are currently attending, and consider yourselves bona fide and good members. Today's message is for you, because even though we are God's people, we can become lackadaisical in our devotion to God, we can become sidetracked, some can become hypocritical in their true devotion to the Lord, and others can, as the Bible puts it, can ease. And in other words, say, well, since this is, life is like this, let's just do whatever we want until the Lord comes. We're going to get to all of that, Lord willing, today. Because God was dealing with primarily in this whole book of Amos, his whole focus is on two sets of people. One group were religious hypocrites. And we'll define what that means in a minute. The other group were those who said, let's just take it easy and do whatever we want. Since life is as it is, since we have uh, hardships, and since God is going to come and one day judge us, well, since we're doomed anyway, man, let's just enjoy ourselves. So God deals with two kinds of groups in this address today, and we're going to use the book of Amos to bring it out. We're going to highlight God's patience, how God has been blessing them, and still they ignored him appropriate this to yourselves today. Are you one of those who God has been blessing and still you haven't turned fully to him in your devotion and way of life? We're going to get to all of that, Lord willing, today 
in this message, but we're, we have to address it through the book of Amos because that's what God did when, the, when Israel were his people. Now, and I say his people meaning exclusively because God had not branched out to the Gentiles as a group. Of course, we know one or two Gentiles have always received the blessings of God. But as a group, God was only and primarily focused on Israel at this time. And God's warning to them by his prophets have gone unheeded in many cases. And here today we have Amos. Amos was what we would call today a cowboy preacher. He's called a herdsman. And he, 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 he herded up flocks and and he also tended the sycamore fruit, the trees. So he was known as also a sort of farmer. But he was not considered part of the prophet, the guild of prophets. He was not the son of a prophet. He was not considered the, the elite of prophets. And you'll notice he says, listen, I was just told by God to go say this. So the, the guild of prophets sort of ignored him. And don't forget this, by now the guild, if you will, of prophets, a lot of them were corrupt. All of the northern kingdom was corrupt. The southern kingdom of Judah, some of the kings were good, like the Hezekiahs and the, some of the other ones, Joash, I believe it is, and maybe one or two others. But all of the kings of the northern kingdom were corrupt. God sent Amos to that northern kingdom, but he also sent a warning to the southern kingdom, Judah, because they are still part of the total people of Israel, though the kingdom, as David and Solomon left it, is now divided. Ten tribes to the north, known as Israel or Joseph sometimes, or Samaria, the, the capital, and the tri two tribes to the south, known as Judah. Today, we're going to see where they were willing to accept when God sent punishment and judgment to their neighbors around them who were their enemies. But when it came to hearing the word of God from the prophet Amos, they said, don't preach that here. Don't preach God's word here. Don't prophesy to us. Go take that to someone else. And Israel said, take it to Judah. We don't want to hear that here. And the, and the corrupt priest Amaziah got with the corrupt king, Jeroboam II of the northern kingdom, and they were against Amos. And they did not want to hear what God had Amos go tell his people. And by the way, don't confuse Amos, A-M-O-S, with Amos, which is A-M-O-Z, the father of Isaiah. They're not the same people. So we're talking about the prophet, sometimes called the minor prophets, only because their books are small, the minor prophet Amos. He was sent, this is all historical background, we're going to get to the, how it applies to us today. He was sent to warn the people of God that their sinfulness is going to be judged. Justice is going to be done to them after such a long time of God's patience with them. Now, the purpose of this sermon today is that God is impartial. God doesn't show favoritism. God made it clear from, the, from a long time ago he's going to save Gentiles as well as Israelites or Jews or Hebrews. But God said, first, it is my prerogative to come through the Jews. So he went down among the Gentiles and got him a man called Abraham. And he loved on him. And he loved on his descendants. So God though he got Abraham from among Gentiles and made him a special person, people, God's plan from the beginning was to save all types of people on the planet, no matter what your ethnicity is. So God makes it very clear that his saving is impartial, but in today's sermon, he also makes it very clear that his judgment is also impartial. So today's sermon is called God is Impartial. And then in parentheses, in saving and judgment. God saves freely. Let me take you to the New Testament. Remember when Peter said in Acts, and I'll quote uh, Acts 10, 10, 34, then Peter opened his mouth and said, of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. God is not partial. God is not prejudiced. God doesn't favor one ethnicity over another when it comes to saving. God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation, not just the Jewish nation, not just the African nations, not just in China, not just in Europe, but in every nation, he that feareth God, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him, with God. So that's a very clear statement. 
that God is very impartial, not favoring, it doesn't show favoritism when it comes to saving people. I hope you got that again. He says, but in every nation he that feareth him, God, and he that worketh righteousness is accepted with God, with him. That is simply a statement, and why am I saying this? It's simply a statement to show that God will save anyone. He's impartial. But, someone will say, but why does the Old Testament dedicate itself to the, to the Jews primarily? Because God first came through them. It was God's plan to come through them. Even the gospel came first to the Jews, and then it branched out to the Gentiles. So, so someone will ask why. It was God's plan. And I'll give you Paul. <laughs> Who are thou to answer against God, O man? Meaning, in chapter 7 of Romans, how can you question God? It's God's prerogative to do the plan of salvation the way he will. And he chose to come through the Hebrew, the Jewish people first. So, moving on to another scripture that supports that God is impartial in Acts. Again, Peter is quoted in Acts 15, 7. Acts 15, 7. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up, and said to them, this is at the council in Jerusalem, when Paul and Barnabas and James, the brother of Jesus, and everybody was arguing and disputing, Peter rose up and said, because I'll tell you this, some were saying that anyone that comes to Jesus has to go through this and go through the Judaism, Judaizing yourselves. Peter stood up and said, men and brethren, verse 7, chapter 15 of Acts, ye know that how a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. God is impartial when it comes to saving. His point is he gave the Gentiles the Holy Ghost as well as he gave Jews. I'm making this point just to say, you see how God does not show favoritism. He went to the, through the Jews first, but God always opened up salvation to everyone, even the Gentiles. Moving on, verse 9. And God, he's, he's saying, put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. I hope you got the message here that from Acts 10, 34, and 35, and Acts 15, 7, 8, and 9, Peter made it very clear that God is impartial when it comes to saving. Remember again the title today. God is impartial, in parentheses, in saving and in punishment. I'm establishing here in the beginning that in saving, you clearly see he's impartial because God opened up salvation to everyone. And with the advent of Jesus and his first ministry here on earth, he brought it to and through salvation, to and through the gospel, the Jews. And then he made it such that it would branch out to all people, but he came first to the household of Israel. And that was just God's plan. But God, through the word, makes it very clear that saving is open to everyone. No matter your ethnicity, no matter which language you speak, no matter how you look, you are free to have salvation. And everyone loves that because we say, oh, now all can be saved. We love that. Yes, we do. Now let's get to the focus of today's message. Also, God is impartial when it comes to punishment or judgment. Someone will say, why then does God punish the Gentiles who didn't have his word? Is God fair? Then you must be forgetting Romans. Romans tells us that God has given everyone a chance. How? Well, God put it on the hearts and conscience of every human being on the planet to obey his law. Now, the thing that God, God, if you will, that God could not put up with is when man ignored the heart and the conscience that God gave him and got so cruel with one another, and you'll see when we get to the Gentile nations around Israel that God punished, they got so cruel that God finally wrought judgment or punishment on them. But how is that fair? The nations didn't have God's written word. God says, and if you will stay with me here in Romans 2, 14, there's no excuse for anyone to be cruel and to uh, mistreat your fellow human being. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, what is that saying? 
when the Gentiles who didn't have the law of Moses, the written law of Moses, for when the Gentiles, Paul is saying, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these not having the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the, work of the uh, written law is in their hearts. Meaning, even though the Gentiles did not have the written law of Moses, God put in every human being a, a heart and a conscience to know what is right and what is wrong. Man knows cruel, cruelty and slavery is wrong. Man still did it. Man knows to oppress the poor is wrong. They still did it. Man still does it. People know when it's uh, wrong to cheat someone in a financial dealing. People still do it. Why do they know it's wrong? Because the, the Bible says here in Romans 2, 14 and 15, for when the Gentiles, the non-believers, those who didn't have the law, for when they which have not the law do by nature, they just know, by na nature tells you what is right and what is wrong. You know it's wrong to abuse an elderly person. Why? It's just in your conscience. You know it's wrong. That's what the word is saying here. So this is where, the point we're getting to. How can God judge the nations that didn't have the written law of Moses? Paul says they had no excuse for their cruelty and their unfairness because when the Gentiles, the non-believers, the non-Jewish people, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves. Meaning, their conscience and their heart tells them what's wrong, therefore they know. They are a law unto themselves. They know right from wrong. He goes on in verse 15 of Romans, the second chapter. Which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing them witness, and their thoughts, the meanwhile, accusing or else excusing one another. Meaning, people do cruelty knowing it's wrong, and then they excuse themselves for whatever reasoning they give themselves. But God has put in each and every human being a conscience to know what is right and what is wrong. So someone might ask, why is God so angry then with his people? Why is God so angry? Well, listen, if cruelty makes them angry and they were cruel to one another, the, Israelite, the, Israelis, the Israelites were cruel to one another and the pagans or the Gentiles were cruel to one another. If cruelty makes him angry, it is because his heart wants kindness towards others shown by man. If oppression, and we spoke of the oppression of the poor and the fatherless and the widows, if oppression of others stirs God's wrath, it is because he wants people to live in love and peace. If pain inflicted upon others brings judgment from God, it is because his heart intends happiness and well-being for humanity. God is impartial in saving as much as he is in judgment. So that's why God can judge, when we get to it, the nations around Israel which were so cruel, not only to Israel, but to their own people. And God had it with them, and you'll see when we get to it how God pronounces in, in, in uh, the book of Amos judgment, justice, on each nation. Now, Israel and Judah had the written law of Moses. So here's how God can judge them. Because God is saying, you, my people, had the word. You had it written down. The nations didn't. They had it on their conscience. They had it on their hearts. They knew right from wrong because it's in human nature. However, Israel and Judah, you have no excuse because you were given the written law of Moses. You were given the miracles in your nation. You were given prophets sent by God. You were given blessings from God when he brought you up out of Egypt and, and, and defeated the Amorites for you. When you thought they were giants and you couldn't overtake them, God gave you blessings. He brought you manna, bread from heaven. He, you survived. He's given you blessings over and over, and you've had even the written law of Moses that Moses wrote down for you. So... Gentiles, non-believers that never heard of the written word of God have no excuse because of Romans 2, 14 and 15. God put it on your heart to know what's right and what's wrong. So when you're cruel and unfair and you oppress the homeless and the, the orphans and the poor and the widow, God says, you know it's wrong. So he has the right to judge them. And that's why he did judge those nations around Israel. But he says also, my people, this is what is applicable to us today, saints. We're God's people. We have the written word. He says, my people can be judged because I gave them the law written down. So, when we look at Amos, the book of Amos, don't forget today's sermon. God is impartial. 
Everyone loves when he's impartial to saving. Anyone can come to God and be saved. You don't have to be of the house of Israel anymore. You don't have to be a Jew. You don't have to be a Hebrew. Great. God is impartial. He doesn't show favoritism. Right? Yes. But he's also impartial when it comes to judgment and or punishments. And this is what even people today tend to ignore and forget. Thinking, I'm in the church. I'm saved. Listen, I believe in Jesus. So I know it's all right. All my sins have been nailed to the cross. What am I worried about? The word here today says, if you really are a believer, if you really are, and you claim to be, and you may be, the word is saying, why isn't your behavior becoming more and more godlike every day? Why is it that you've sat back and said, as a religious hypocrite, oh, times are so hard. Even today, we have this disease, this COVID-19. And people are saying there are financial woes, there are racial, there's racial injustice. We see that every day. It's even in the news today with that young man in Georgia. There's social injustice. There's, uh, there are messed up relationships, relationships, family and friends. Jobs are hard to find. Uh, you got a terrible diagnosis of cancer or AIDS or something else. And some say, I've always had a medical condition I could never get over. God is too hard on us. Life is so unfair. There are wars, there are corrupt politicians and leaders. They're crooked businessmen and women. Life's just too hard. God deals with people like that by saying, all right, if, if life is just so hard, why hasn't your behavior become more and more godlike, seeing that this is upon us and God has allowed this? Why hasn't all these troubles made you say, you know what, let me get right with God? You can't take for granted, well, I'm saved, so I can basically just live it out and just wait until God comes. The Bible in Amos, the Word of God, gets and deals with that. And God even says, I'm sick, and I'm, let me paraphrase, God says, I'm sick of you all saying, I'm a member of the church. I've been a member for 50 years. And God says, and you come, and you sing, and you testify, and you talk of the goodness of the Lord, and yet you complain, I can't wait till God comes. Don't we all say that? Every one of us says that with all this social injustice, how hard life is. I can't wait till the day of the Lord. I can't wait till God comes and takes care of all this evil. The Bible says, watch out. You can't wait for the day of the Lord. It says it's going to be like darkness for you unless you yourselves who claim to know the Lord, claim to be in the household of God, unless your behavior, what you're doing, what you're thinking, your lifestyle, is it really Godly, godlike. Don't forget what Peter said in 1 Peter 4, 4 17. Peter says, Judgment begins at the household of God. We shouldn't think it a strange thing when God sends punishments, when God sends disease, when God sends hardships, when God sends, uh, sends uh, uh, disruption in your lives. God will correct his people from within. And Peter tells us it begins, correction, punishment, begins at the household of faith. So he may punish the unbelieving peoples of the world as he does with the nations around Israel. But don't forget what Peter said. God begins his correction and his punishment at the household of God. Remember uh, Paul tells us in Corinthians that for this reason, some sleep and are sick and even some you know, die, he was saying. Point is, you keep taking God for granted and not being sincere about your growth in the word and your uh, need to turn to him and be like him, to rethink. That's all repent means. Someone says, I've repented, I've been baptized. We're not talking about that here. We're talking about lifestyle that reflects that you appreciate that God's day of judgment is coming soon. Remember Ananias and Sapphira, they were in the church. But didn't God cleanse the church of them? Punishment, correction, judgment begins in the house, at the household of God, Peter says in 1 Peter 4, 17. Please read that and understand what he's saying. God will always exact punishment on wrongdoing. And Peter made it very clear he's going to begin with his own people. Meaning he will not be partial and let his own people get away with sinful living. 
a lack of growth. And I often plead with you saints, I say, do you really let the word of God make a change in your life when you hear it? Really? It's one thing to want to come together and sing. Everyone loves church songs and hymns and gospel tunes. We all do. Great, the Lord says. Great. But the Lord is saying, unless your heart is really turned toward him, not when it's convenient, not when people are watching, not when you come to church, not when you're on your your conference calls and you're encouraging one another. No, all the time is your heart really pricked and cut where you want to be more and more like God every day. This is the plight that's given to those of us who call ourselves believers. We know there are hard times. God says, I send hard times to strengthen, to correct, and sometimes to chastise you. God does that. You'll see God, God told his own people, I sent the, the, the hardships that you've had, and still you won't turn to me. How does that apply to us today? We complain, this COVID, I'm sick of wearing these masks. I'm sick of being locked in my house. Are you taking advantage of the fact that God not only is speaking to us, he's speaking to the world by allowing what he's allowing. Are we taking advantage of this saying, what is God saying to me through this, through these hardships? Don't forget, read Hebrews. Read other scriptures that tell us hardships are sent to correct his people, to strengthen his people, and sometimes to chasten, but not to destroy, but as a parent will correct or chasten the child, not to destroy the child. We're God's children. God allows what he allows so we may learn from it. Which who, which of us are learning from these hardships? You say, well, my family would never get along. Is he using that to make you more like him? God uses a myriad, a, a many different ways of getting our attention. Is it an illness? Is it a sickness? Is it some physical debilitation? In any experience we go through, didn't I always say, seek God in it first? What is God teaching you? I tripped and stumped my foot. Well, it was God, what do you get out of that? You just thought it was an arbitrary accident. Was that an opportunity for you to say, hey, let me call on him more? Because I can guarantee you when that pain hits your foot, you'll call on him. But now stay sincere. Are you gonna to turn to him? God, you'll see when we get to it in the scripture, God says, I've done this. I sent you these hard times. You didn't even recognize I was doing it. God says, and still you won't turn to me. So let me come again and say to us, all of us today as Christians, all that we're going through, all that you individually are going through, do you ever stop and think, what is God, where is God in this? Some will say, oh, it's just a coincidence, it had nothing to do with God. Really? Not a hair falls from your head that God didn't ordain. Nothing happens that God did not allow. God is aware of and in charge of everything. So someone will say, oh, you're just a fanatic. You stumped your toe or you hurt your toe, and now you're saying God has something to do with it. Yes, I'm a believer. Everything I do, every moment I breathe, God has something to do with it. And the, the challenge for we believers is find God in everything. In everything, you can learn something from God. There's a message. I don't care what he allows us to go through. How You, you may say, oh, it's so menial. God can't have anything to do with this. Didn't the Bible say not a sparrow, not a bird falls and dies that God's not aware of? He knows the number of every hair on your head. That's how involved God is in every little aspect of everything that happens. Here's the challenge. How do we take it in? How do we process that? How do we process what? Any and everything that happens to you, does it lead to you getting right with God? There's a message from God in everything we experience in life. The good times with one another, when you're on the phone and you're, or you're texting and you're enjoying one of your communiques with one of your brothers or sisters, where is God in it? I'm not saying get self-righteous, I mean see, is this God giving me some kind of joy here? If there's a harsh exchange, should I be the one learning to be more like Christ and be long-suffering, be patient. There's something to be gleaned from every experience in life. And this, 
the Israelites, the, the people of Israel, and even the kingdom of Judah, they got so comfortable being God's people, some even turned like the northern kingdom, they turned from God, and many in the southern kingdom turned from God, and God used judgments and punishments and hardships and hard times to get their attention. But just as God is impartial, showing no favoritism in who he will allow to be saved, he also does not slack off or show favoritism in those he corrects or punishes. Therefore, again, the title, God is impartial, in parentheses, in saving and in judgment. Let us begin here, and I'll just refer to it. If you go to Amos, the first chapter, look at the first chapter of Amos, and you'll see how God begins to pronounce punishments on Damascus. All these are all the enemies and surrounding neighbors, neighboring nations of Israel. On Damascus, today's Syria, Gaza, Palestine, uh, Tyre, Lebanon, Edom, Amman, uh, and, 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 uh, and uh, Moab, Jordan today. All these surrounding neighbors, God pronounces judgment on them. And when he was pronouncing judgment on them, Israel was fine with that. But when God came to pronounce judgment on Israel and Judah, that's when they had objection. And that's where we're going to pick up here today. Why? Because we should see ourselves as the people of God. And you'll see now, and we are the people of God, but then these were the people of God. Many had turned from him. Many became corrupt. And they worshipped they worshiped other gods. And they even used some of the hallowed shrines of Abraham and some of the other ancestors of, them, of, of the Jewish people. And they turned them into pagan places of worship. Totally desecrating holy sites, if you will. And turned from God to false gods. But life got so comfortable for them because under Jeroboam II, the northern kingdom Israel was very successful. They were living in luxury. And they were oppressing the poor. They were insensitive to the poor. They were even selling their own people as slaves. It says for silver and gold, for money. And they were oppressing uh, the poor. Even that it says that uh, even a man and his son would go into the same girl, meaning since it's in the same reference, meaning they took advantage of little slave girls, young, young slave girls, and took advantage of them sexually. They were so insensitive, they turned so against God, their crimes reached up to heaven because they got so comfortable with God's blessings, they turned from God. And as I said, the whole northern kingdom, all the kings were corrupt. And so the priests, many of the priests were corrupt, as you'll see Amaziah was. And God used his Elijahs and Elishas and Amoses and others to correct, or to go preach, I should say, to prophesy, because many of them didn't take the correction, to prophesy to the northern kingdom known as Israel. And just for by way of history, uh, Amos was a contemporary of Jonah, Hosea, and Isaiah. They were contemporaries of one another. And preaching to this, this wicked kingdom, Yes, they were, the, they were still called God's people, but they were God's people gone wrong, if you will. And this message is not only turn to God, it's get right with God. We used to sing a song in this particular organization, which was so true, get right with God and do it now. And you'll see throughout Amos, God keeps telling the, the, his people, I've done this to you. He goes from I blessed you to I sent you, I sent you hardships and still you won't turn to me. So the whole point is, rethink, turn to me. Not just stop what you're doing. Yes, stop what you're doing and turn to me. That was God's whole point. This is a, Amos is a message of repent, 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 or judgment is coming. To whom? God's own people. How does that apply to us today? God is saying, if we would only, if he that has ears, let us hear. If we would only hear and observe the signs of the times, God is speaking to us, and he's saying, let your worship be real. Because God is saying, Hip religious hypocrites, I abhor. And he says, your sacrifices, in those days, they act actually sacrificed. That was their service. For us today, it would be your church services, your choir singing, your service in the church, whatever you do. God says, keep it. I hate it. I despise it. Because it's not sincere. Because I'm not saying the church today, at everyone is like that. I'm saying, are you one that this could apply to? Are you sincere about 
your growth in the Lord, about being a representative of Christ, really, in your character, the way you are with others, your lifestyle in general, that which is seen and unseen, God can see it. Or, remember we said in the last sermon, there's nothing hid from God. There's no darkness to God. He can see through all the sneaky things people do. So this message today is, judge yourselves. Each and every one of us, are you taking this opportunity of hardships even, to turn to the Lord more and more. And I would laud many of you that you have been. And I'm asking those of us, I, mean, I preach it to myself first, are you taking it seriously that you are God's people and it's just a matter of time before judgment comes? Now, when I say judgment comes to the church, I am not saying those in the church are going to go to damnation. That's not how God will send judgment to his own. He will correct you. Perhaps, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians, he says, sometimes it's sickness, perpetual. Sometimes it's perpetual unrest. Sometimes it's perpetual hardships in life. And sometimes he goes on and takes your life physically. But to purify or cleanse his church, his people, God will send punishments, judgments, but it's only to help or chasten or correct us, not to destroy our souls. But sometimes he will destroy the body to save the soul and to save the purity of his church. We're going to start here in Amos, the second chapter, where after in the first chapter, and I'll leave that for you to read on your own, in the first chapter where he sends woes. When you see the word woes, it means punishment or judgment to. He sends woes, as I said before, to Damascus, to Gaza, to Tyre, to Edom, to Ammon and to Moab, God sends punishments to them. And the Jewish people of, the, of, uh, the, of Israel, they were fine with that until the Lord turned to them. And then they said, and let me just jump ahead and just show you what uh, the prophet, uh, I should say the priest, Amaziah said to uh, Amos. When Amos came preaching against them, then Amos, uh, then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, Bethel was in the northern kingdom in Samaria, near, uh, in that region, where they had turned worship into false gods, worshiping false gods. So they turned from God. So uh, Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, this is Jeroboam II, he was corrupt too, but the Lord blessed him to be financially very successful, so the kingdom was living richly. And they didn't want to interrupt that and turn back to the Lord, because they were loving all their pagan and their sinful ways. Verse 10 of uh, the, the seventh chapter of uh, Amos. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For this is what Amos said. This, this is Amaziah telling King Jeroboam II, Amos is out there preaching against you, and here's what he said. Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive from their land. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Go, you seer, mean get away from here. So you see the corrupt priest is telling God's prophet Amos, Don't preach that mess here. It's not mess, but that's what he's saying. Don't you preach that here. Go, you seer, flee to the land of Judah. Go tell the southern kingdom Judah this. Don't tell this to us up here in Israel. We want to stay pagan worshiping. We want to do whatever we want to do. We want to live luxuriously. Look at how we're so blessed and so rich. We don't want that to mess up. We don't want to think about God and his punishments. Ah, that won't come. And if it does, let us live, eat, drink, and be merry. Who cares? This is what they're saying. Go, you seer, one who sees the future. Go, you seer, flee to the land of Judah. There eat bread and there prophesy, meaning go there and earn your living. Go preach to the, the lower kingdom, Judah. But never again prophesy at Bethel, for it's the king's sanctuary and it's, a royal, it's his royal residence. Meaning this is where the king lives. This is where good times are. Don't bring that here. Don't insult the king by bringing your, your preaching against him here. And then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor was I the son of a prophet, but I was a sheep breeder and a tender of sycamore fruit. Then the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said to me, go prophesy to my people Israel. I didn't choose this on my own. He says, I'm not from the guild of prophets. I'm not one of the elite. Uh, there was a guild or a group of prophets. And he was saying, I'm not one of them. 
as Samuel was, but he says, I'm not one of them. He says, uh, go prophesy. Uh, he says, the Lord said, this is Amos saying, I didn't choose this. He said, the Lord told me to go tell you all this, to go tell Israel this. The Lord told me and said, go prophesy, go preach to my people Israel. Go predict and tell them what will happen. Now, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. But you say, do not prophesy against Israel and do not spout against the house of Isaac. You see what is happening here? The priest has conspired, the priest Amaziah has conspired to be in cahoots with the king. Amos says, I was minding my business. I was a cowboy. I was a herdsman. I was taking care of the flocks. I was taking care of the sycamore fruit. And the Lord told me to come tell you this. This is not my prophecy, but it was all right when Amos prophesied against the neighbors of Israel. But when he came to Israel, you see even the very priest Amaziah got against him and said, don't bring that here. We don't want to hear that here. But let us begin here at Amos, the second chapter, I hope everyone has it, Amos, the second chapter, and the fourth verse. Now what we're coming off of is all prior to this from Amos 1 until now, God, through Amos, was prophesying against Israel's neighbors, and Israel was fine with that. But now, the Lord, uh, where does judgment begin? At the household of God. God says, my people are not immune from judgment. He says this to Judah. Thus says the Lord, Judah, again, is the lower, the smaller kingdom of the two tribes, where all the ten tribes of the north stayed and became known as Israel. All of them are Israelis, if you will. We'll, we'll clarify that in a minute. But right now, the two kingdoms are divided, and the Lord is addressing them like that. So he begins with Judah. And you'll see that Amos' main target is the larger kingdom of Israel, which was totally corrupt. He says, thus says the Lord. This is Amos talking to the people of Judah. For three transgressions of Judah, and for four, it's just a dramatic, poetic way of saying, for four things, uh, I will not turn away its punishment. In other words, you're going to get punished because of four things you do. Because you have despised the law of the Lord, and you have, kept his, you have not kept his commandments. Uh, their lies led them astray, lies which their fathers followed. But I will send a fire upon Judah, and it shall, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem. That's a quick prophecy against the southern kingdom of Judah, where the Lord is saying, I'm going to judge you for your wickedness. First of all, you despise my law, my word. You don't like the word of God. And you believe lies. You've turned to these false gods, just as some of your fathers did. Then you'll see at verse 6, Amos turns his attention to Israel, the larger kingdom, the ten tribes of the north. And that's his main target, actually, because that's where all the overt wickedness was being lived out, and they were doing it with uh, impunity. He says, thus says the Lord, this is judgment now on Israel being pronounced, for three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not turn away its punishment, Israel's punishment, because they sell the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of sandals. Did you see what he just said? You're selling your own people for money and for a pair of sandals. You're, you're, you're putting your own people into slavery. He says, they pant after the dust of the earth, which is on the head of the poor. In other words, they mistreat the poor completely. And pervert the way of the humble. A man and his father go into the same girl to defile my holy name. Clearly, because of the reference to the poor, the emphasis is here that the rich were taking advantage of poor slave girls. Even the father and son were having the same poor little slave girl. The Lord is saying, look at the wickedness you're doing. I cannot tolerate this among my people. Someone will say, how does that apply to us today? All I am showing you by showing you this is that the Lord does not put up with wickedness among his people when it goes on with impunity and a sense of complacency settles in among his people where Nothing seems to be happening. Let us just go on enjoying our sinful ways. God says, there comes a period and a time when I'm fed up and I've had enough and your cruelty has come up to me and I can take it no longer. They should have learned that from the days of the flood with Noah. God only takes so much and then he sends judgment. But let me carry on. And uh, this is verse 8 of the second chapter of uh, Amos where God is prophesying through Amos against the northern kingdom Israel. They lie down by every altar on clothes taken in pledge and drink the wine of the condemned in the house of their God. 
the false gods. Now, back then, people would make a pledge with their coat or their outer garments. And he said, instead of paying their debts, they would lie down and keep them and keep on worshiping at these false altars. I know that doesn't apply to us today. We don't have that kind of thing. Let's just sum it up. What he's saying is, you're sinning with impunity and you just don't regard God. And God has had enough. Yet, verse 9, it was I. Now, this is God saying this. Listen, please, carefully to this because it applies to us. No, we were not Israelites coming out of Egypt. No, we didn't have to fight the Amorites. Remember the two spies that, the, the spies that went over and looked and got scared and came back and said, they're giants. We can't beat them. How can we defeat them? And God says, didn't I defeat them for you? Here's how he says it. Yet, it was I, God is saying, who destroyed the Amorite before them, before the people of Israel, whose height, talking about the Amorites, whose height was like the height of the cedar, the cedar tree, meaning they looked like giants to you, didn't they? You were scared of them. And he says, and he, meaning the Amorites, and he was strong as the oaks. Yet I, God is saying, I destroyed his fruit above and his roots beneath. Also, it was I who brought you up out of the land of Egypt and led you 40 years through the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. God Translation, let's just sum it up. God said, I blessed you. I defeated the enemy when you were so scared of them, you came back crying saying, we can't beat them, they look like giants. God says, didn't I defeat them for you? Notice God says, I, God did it. I don't care what, however it happened, what fighting God allowed you to be successful, God said he did it. As God is uh, the one we can do nothing without anyway in any of our successes in life. Now listen to this. God goes on to say how I blessed you. He's, God says, I raised up some of your sons as prophets. I sent prophets to you. And some of your young men as Nazarites, those who had the special vows they would take to show their dedication and holiness to God, such as Samson and others, who were Nazarites. They didn't drink wine and didn't do certain, they didn't cut their hair. They had certain vows they had to keep. Listen to this. God said, is it not so, O you children of Israel? Didn't I do that? In other words, didn't I bring you up out of Egypt? Didn't I help defeat the Amorites who you were afraid of? Didn't I send you prophets? Didn't I give you holy men, men with t who took vows and fulfilled them, many of them, and, and uh, showing you how special you are to me? God says, didn't I do that to you, O children of Israel, says the Lord? But you gave the Nazarites wine to drink. He's saying, but you made them pervert their vows. And commanded the prophets, saying, do not prophesy. And the prophets I sent you, you said, we don't want to hear your preaching. Do you see what God is saying? I sent you blessings. I've blessed you over and over. And you ignored me. Behold, this is God said, look, I had enough. Behold, I am weighed down. I'm weighed down by you. As a cart full of sheaves is weighed down, therefore flight shall perish from the swift. Meaning when I send that Assyrian army, I don't care how fast you are, you won't be able to run from them. Flight shall flee from the swift. The strong shall not, uh, shall not strengthen his power nor shall the mighty deliver himself. He shall not stand who handles the bow. The swift of foot shall not escape, nor shall he who rides the horse deliver himself. The most courageous men of might shall flee naked in, the day, in that day, says the Lord. What the Lord is saying is, since you've ignored my blessings, now you always apply this to yourself, since you ignored my blessings, you won't be able to escape the great punishment that was coming to them. Now you will remember through history that the Lord sent the Assyrian army, which was a, considered the, the cruelest people in the, ancient, in the ancient world, if not the cruelest, some of the cruelest. The Lord sent them as his hand to punish his people, to get their attention, to make them appreciate how he's already blessed them. And he sent these warnings. And you saw back in Amos 7, I skipped ahead there, they had been warned now, you see, in, in, in chapter 2, and they still don't want to hear the word of God. We don't want to hear that. Go preach that in Judah. Don't preach that to us here. We don't prophesy here. The Lord says, I sent you and have given you these blessings over the years, and you still won't turn to me, is what he's saying. Listen to this as we go on to chapter 3. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel. Now listen to this. And against the whole family which I brought up, from the land of Egypt. Why did he say the whole family after just saying the children of Israel? Because he now included the southern kingdom of Judah. Because they all came out of Egypt as one people. 
but after Solomon, the kingdom got divided, the ten tribes to the north and the two tribes to the south. The ten tribes to the north under Jeroboam the first, and we're now in the day of Jeroboam the second, and then the tribes to the south went under the sons of Solomon. They only got two uh, uh, tribes. And the, the largest part of the kingdom was Israel, the tribe to the north, the, the kingdom to the north. But the Lord says, listen to me, if you will, the word spoken against you through Amos, O children of Israel, that's the northern kingdom, then he includes both, and against the whole family, that's all the Hebrew people, all the Jewish people, which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, only you have I known of all the families of the earth. Now that's what they wanted to hear. It sounds like he's about to be, oh, the Lord says, look at how I've blessed you. Only you, I chose you. God says, I didn't come to the other nations of the world. I came to you, Israel. Look how blessed you were. Only you have I known of all the families of the earth. We're in Amos, the third chapter, second verse. What a blessing. Listen to this. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. Did you see that? He says, I chose you, especially. only you did I know. Only you were mine. And that's why I'm going to punish you, because you're mine. Punishment, judgment begins at the household of God, 1 Peter 4, 17. God is making it clear, I'm punishing you because I've given you such privilege and advantage and blessing, and you still won't turn to me. Then he goes to that famous phrase that everyone always quotes, can two walk together except they be agreed? God says, how can I carry on with you? You don't agree with me, you've turned to other gods. How can I continue to ignore this sin against me? So, while they were being blessed in good times, they were having great times there in the northern kingdom, turned against God though, but financially and socially, and they were doing well. And God says, in all this, you turned against me. But look at how blessed you were. He gave them the history, going back to Egypt. And then he came on down and said, I sent you prophets and, and holy men, and I've blessed you, and you still won't turn to me. He says, now look, of all the people on the planet, I came to you. And that's the reason I'm sending judgment to you. Do you see how God is impartial? Not only did he punish Damascus, Gaza, Tyre, Edom, Ammon, and Moab, he also says, and my own people, Judah and Israel, the northern kingdom and the southern uh, kingdom, Israel being the northern, Judah being the southern. He says, I'm punishing you too. Why? Because of all the people on the all the peoples on the planet, I've known you only. I came to you. And this is why I'm punishing you, punishing you. Can two walk together except they be agreed? And now we're, let's, I'm going to jump through uh, the, the book of Amos. We're not going chapter by chapter here, giving you the overview. Because now it brings us to almost where we are today. Because God is now saying, I've even sent you hardships. And you won't turn to me. Again, let me bring it into us today. Whatever it is you're going through. Why don't you ever take the time to say, maybe I should become more holy, more like God, more God-like. God starts off here in the fourth chapter. Uh, when I say starts off, I'll pick up here because all of the fourth chapter, you'll see how he's uh, uh, reminding them, I did this, I did this, and you still won't turn to me. But since we are with this COVID-19 today, let's pick up where God even says, I use pestilence or disease. God said, I sent among you a plague, a pestilence, a disease, a sort of COVID. He says, I sent a plague among you after the manner of Egypt. Your young men I killed, I, God said, I killed with a sword, along with your captive horses and took the horses captive. I made the stench of your camps come up to your nostrils. Yet, this, this is the Lord's whole point, yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. I want you to see that, saints, clearly, that the Lord is saying, I've even, first of all, you just saw where he sent them blessings, brought you up out of Egypt, blessed you, defeated the Amorites for you, gave you holy men, all, and you won't turn to me. Now he says, I've even given you hardships, and you won't turn to, to me. And he goes on, uh, verse 11, uh, chapter 4 of Amos. I overthrew some of you as God, now this is, uh, if you will, Amos using as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, a sort of uh, footnote, if you will. I overthrew some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were like a firebrand plucked from the burning. Meaning, 
as some of you just barely escaped, right? Look, what does God say now? Yet you have not turned, returned to me or turned to me. What is God saying here? Even in the case of Sodom and Gomorrah, I could have destroyed all of you, but some of you made it out, just like pulling a firebrand out of a fire. He says to you, he was talking to them, the people of that day, I've overthrown some of you, and yet you don't consider that you've just made it out, as they say, by the skin of your teeth. You just made it out as a firebrand, he says, plucked from the burning. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. Therefore, thus will I do unto you, O Israel, because I will do this to you. Because I will do this, I like this. Because I will do this to you, pre prepare to meet your God, O Israel. Same thing that today. God is saying, I have known you. I've loved you. And if you won't turn to me, you better prepare to meet your God. And don't rest on the fact, I'm saved. And God says, and why don't you show it more in your behavior? Why are you acting so, comfortable, so comfortably in your lives as though you can do whatever you want? Two groups of people God is addressing here, as I said earlier. The religious hypocrites, we're going to get to that in a minute, and also those who want to just take it easy and say, we'll do whatever. We got it like that. We're God's people. Even if we go to damnation, who cares? Let's enjoy our lives now. God is, I want you to see here, God has warned them. Therefore, thus says the Lord, verse 12, to you, O Israel, uh, I will do this, he says, to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you, prepare to meet your God. And then he goes on to, if you will, to tell them who he is. He says, for behold, he who forms the mountains and creates the wind, who declares to man what his thought is, and makes morning darkness, who treads the high places of the earth, the Lord God of hosts is his name. God just ends up with, don't forget who you're dealing with here. I'm the one who made the mountains. I'm the one who created the wind. I tell man what I'm going to do. I make morning darkness if I choose. I tread the high places of the earth. This is the Lord God you're dealing with, he's saying. And the Lord is saying, I'm the one that's going to do that. Now come on over to Amos, the fifth chapter, and we'll take up here at the 18th verse, and this is the thrust of where I wanted to get to today. This is God dealing with religious hypocrites who, seeing how he's blessed you, let's, let's bring it before I get to that, let's talk about us today. Many of us have been blessed. We've been brought out of the miry clay into the marvelous light. Well, that's for the last 28 years or so. God has brought us a long way in understanding his word. We have understood the freedoms in Christ, which we've never heard before. We heard about the dispensation of grace before, but it was never explained to us in depth what that meant. We heard so much before, but we have been so blessed in these last 28 years. And let me ask you this, has that in any way changed your behavior? Don't just go with the, the, the side of, that means, man, we can dress how we want, we can do what we want. God is saying, are you becoming more like me, like God? Has an awareness hit you that I, God saying, I want a sincere heart. When, when I see you sitting in church, and right now we're at home wherever you are, due to this virus, we're spread out all over, and we can't assemble together yet, one day, Lord willing, soon. But God is saying, when you're sitting in church, and you're amening and you're clapping and you're getting up and you're testifying and you're singing in the choir and you're doing your service in the kitchen and you're, you're cleaning up and whatever it is you do, your sergeant arms, your ushers, uh, whatever it is you do, the Lord is saying, but is your behavior, is your heart really turned to me? The Lord says, I see what you're doing. And many of us in this particular organization and those who consider themselves in the one church anyway, God says, yes, you're saved, but are you growing closer to God? Meaning, are you becoming more God-like? We're gonna see here where God can't stand religious hypocrisy. Are you doing it just because, well, I've been doing it for 30 years, 50 years, 80 years, 70 years, so let's go to church, why? It's Sunday. The Lord is saying, no, when you come, even now, when you tuned in today, are you honestly here have you tuned in to hear the word, to be pricked by it, to grow by, by it, to be reprimanded by it, to be chided by it, to be corrected by it, to be uplifted by the word? Is that why you're here today? Or are you here because it's Sunday and we tuned into the buzz and that's what everyone else is doing, so let's just tune into the buzz and go on back to our regular lives, never getting more like God after this service goes off. 
The Lord is crying out to us as he did to Israel. I've done this for you. I've been in your midst. I've been with you. But will you grow from the blessings I've given you? Will you grow from the hardships I've sent you? Are you growing closer to God? Are you becoming more God-like? God puts it this way to those who sit and say, oh, life is so hard. I can't wait till the day of the Lord. This racism gets on my nerves. Social injustice gets on my nerves. It's hard to find employment these days. Man, the financial institutes are just so hard to deal with. I can't wait till God comes. We've all said things like that. When, especially with social injustice and racial injustice and, and, and financial inequities and the various hardships in life and you see uh, child abuse and abuse of the elderly. And don't we always say, Lord, I can't wait till God comes and takes care of all this evil the day of the Lord. Don't confuse that with the day of Christ. The day of Christ is when the, we, the church, gets raptured. But the day of the Lord is when the Lord comes to settle scores, to, 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 uh, to his wrath, to make things right, to punish the wicked. And the Lord is saying, those of you that call yourself my people, you have the nerve to say, I can't wait until the day of the Lord. He says, for you, it won't be such a great day like you think. It might be darkness for you. And I want you to see, saints, please pay attention to what he's saying here. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Who is he speaking to? His people. Do you see how that can apply to us today? Woe to you who are saying, I can't wait till all this racism is over. I can't wait. Fine. But is your heart sincere? Because when the Lord does come, and for those in the church, when he comes is when he takes you. When the Lord does come, are you really ready for him? This is why we should examine ourselves today. And the Lord has given us all this that we have now. This, we don't like being at home, do we? We, we enjoy the sermons now. We enjoy this uh, sharing right now of the word of God. But we'd like to be able to go back to church and go back to our routine. The Lord is saying, mm -hmm. are you learning from this experience that I've allowed everyone to experience? Both the unbeliever and the believer. Are we learning from it? Woe to you, he says, who desire the day of the Lord. He's talking to his people. He says, for what good is the day of the Lord to you? Why is he saying that? He's saying those of you that keep ignoring my word. What is his word? Become more like God, more sanctified, less sinful, more righteous in your thoughts, more long-suffering, fair, justice. And leading up to the men's conference and their theme, justice, loving mercy, and walking humbly before God. Let's deal with some justice here. Are you loving justice, meaning to uh, fairness? Are you loving righteous ways? Do you really? Then are you exemplifying it in your lifestyle? Oh, I can't wait till the day of the Lord comes to get rid of this evil. The Lord says, really, better watch out, those that are waiting for the day of the Lord, if you are not right. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Verse 18, the fifth chapter of Amos. For what good is the day of the Lord to you? It will be darkness and not light. Did you see that? The Lord is saying it's going to be a hard time for a lot of you who think you want the day of the Lord. I know you're fed up with the hardships, the financial woes, the racism, the social injustice. You're, you're fed up with it. I get it. The, the corrupt politicians. Yeah, we're sick of these times, the disease, this, all this COVID and this, all this other famine and, and, and cruelty to one another. Yeah, we're fed up, but the Lord says, do you really want my day to come? Meaning, are you straight with me? The old song, get right with God. Have you examined yourselves? This is what God says to people who have not examined themselves, but sitting there, this is a religious hypocrites, sitting there saying, uh, I can't wait till God comes. I can't wait. And we've all said that. But the message here is make sure you're right before you desire the day of the Lord to come so, so much. And we should desire the day of the Lord. But the Lord's point here is, are you straight? Are you all right? He says, this is what the Lord says. It will be as though a man fled from a lion and ran into a bear. Now, I love the way the Lord uses that. Let's say a lion was about to attack you and you got away. The Lord says, but when my day comes, because life is hard right now, isn't it? It's terrible. Racism, social injustice, COVID-19, can't get a job, unemployment, this hardships, family problem, this and that. The Lord says, but you want my day to come, don't you? He says, running from this lion today, when you run into me, it's going to be like running into a bear. 
if you're not right is the message. If you're not right, the day of the Lord, when you finally have that one-on-one -on -one with him, won't be as you think. It'll be not light, but darkness for you. The Lord says it'll be like a man who got away from a lion and ran straight into the grasp of a bear. Meaning you went from bad to worse, if you will. And it's not what you think it is if you're not right the day of the Lord. He says, woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. For what good is the day of the Lord uh, of the Lord to you? It will be darkness and not light. It won't be what you think. It will be as though a man fled from a lion and met a bear and a bear met him. As though he went into his, his own house, went into his house, leaned on his wall, and a serpent bit him. What does that mean? It'll be, he's using another expression to say, or another illustration to say, the day of the Lord will be like when you made it home and you think you're safe. You're so safe, you can lean on the wall. And when you lean on the wall of your own house where surely I'm safe here, a snake, a viper, came up and bit you. That's what the day of the Lord will be like for those who are not right. You think you made it in safety. You think you're home, everything's good, but the day of the Lord for you will be like getting home, getting to a safe place, a place of comfort so you think, and then get bit by a snake, a poisonous snake. Then he goes on to say, uh, let, me, let me read verse 20 again, uh, verse uh, 19 again. It will be as though a man fled from a lion and a bear met him. Or as though he went into the house, his own house meaning, leaned his hand on the wall and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light? Meaning that doesn't sound very good, does it? If you don't, get, if you don't turn to the Lord, the whole point of this message, God is impartial in saving, yes, as Peter showed us, and also in judgment. And the Lord is saying, if you're not right, the day of the Lord for you will be like making it home and thinking you can lean and relax and get bit by a poisonous snake or fleeing from a lion and running into the arms of a bear. He says, it will not be something good, but something bad, not light, but dark. And uh, he says, is it not very dark with no brightness in it? Meaning it'll be very bad. Now here's where he gets to addressing directly uh, religious hypocrisy. And you heard me say about earlier sitting in church and people seem so religious and yes, Lord, and singing and um hmm. And here's what the Lord says I hate, then he goes, I despise your feast days and do not savor your uh, sacred assemblies. Let me translate because that's the modern English. Let me put it in other words. The Lord is saying, I can't stand your worship. Back then, their worship was certain holy days or feast days and certain burnt offerings. And the Lord says, though you offer me burnt offerings, your grain offerings, I will not accept them. Nor will I regard your fattened uh, peace offerings. You can bring the, bring the best animals and offer them and sacrifice. And you can do all the days and, and uh, sacrifices and ceremonies, with Lord, which I, the Lord, appointed. But the Lord says, I not only hate, I despise them. What is he saying? Well, today, how do we bring our sacrifices, our prayers? How do we worship? In service. The Lord is saying, I don't want your insincere service. He says, I don't only hate them, I despise them. What is the bottom line? The Lord can't stand insincere hearts. People who talk, and you have people who can talk good religion. They can sound good, and I mean, when you get used to it, they sound like, you, you'll think that person, surely, is a holy person, a good religion. And God is saying, if your heart is not sincere, I can't stand it. People that come to church just to mock time, just because it's Sunday, I have to go to church. If you sit, if you sit in amen just to be seen, or you're amening the word of God in insincerity, you're not living it, you don't believe it, you're not fulfilling it. God says, keep your worship. Keep your, God says, I can't stand it. He says, not only do I hate it, he says, I despise it. Listen to this. He says, though you offer me burnt offerings and grain, we don't do that anymore today, and grain offerings. What do we do? Well, he's going to tell you. He says, take away from me the noise of your songs. Ah, so when you come to church and you come before God and all this singing, God says, stop it if you're not sincere. Take away the noise of your song. I don't want to hear it because I hate it. I despise it if you're not sincere. So you see how God is saying religious hypocrisy 
gets under, to use the expression, gets under his skin. He says, I hate, I despise insincere hearts. And we are to examine ourselves today. As he told his people, and we are his people today, I've given you blessings, I've put on you hard times. None of it made you turn to me to correct your ways. None of it made you sort of rethink, repent and turn to me. God is saying that then you can keep your phony forms of dedication, devotion and worship. Back then it was grain offerings, it was burnt offerings of meats and various um, animals. God says keep them, for I will not hear your melody. I will not hear the melody of your stringed instruments. But, here's God, but God says, but here's what I want, to get back and to hint at the men's conference theme. Here's what I want. God says, I want judgment or justice. Let justice run down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. He says, what I want is for you all to be fair and loving and nice with, and equitable with one another. He says, let that run like water, like mighty streams. I don't want insincere and fake shows of worship and devotion, God is saying. If you're not sincere, God said, keep it. God says, you're not fooling me. You may fool Bishop, you may fool the whole Presbytery, you may fool other saints in general. God says, you never fool me. I hate insincere worship. I hate religious hypocrisy. Then he addresses another group of people. And I'll just jump ahead to the sixth because he carries on from 25 to 27 in, in uh, chapter 5, uh, essentially the same thing, saying, he, I can't stand your idols and your false worship. Then he goes on to those who are at ease. And here in the old school, in the old days, we used to say, uh, woe to those that are ease in Zion. And that used to mean for us, woe to those who don't want to do anything in the church. That's not what he's saying here. He is saying, woe to uh, you who are at ease in Zion, Listen to this, and trust in Mount Samaria. Now, all the rest of this are woes, but that first initial woe goes to everything else you're about to hear. And I'll, here's what I'm saying. He says, Zion, that represents Judah, Jerusalem. Zion means Jerusalem. So he says, woe to the capital of the southern kingdom, Judah, and woe to uh, those who worship at, at Mount Samaria. That's the northern kingdom. So he just included all of Israel, so all of his people. So God is saying, woe to all of my people in both kingdoms, and today how will we apply that? Woe to everybody everywhere in the church. Why? Notable persons in the chief nation to whom the house of Israel comes. Now, let, I like this because you have to really research this to know why he said this. Go to Kane, Kalne, and see. And from there, go to Hamath, the great, and go down to Gath of the Philistines. Are you better than these kingdoms, he's asking? Or is their territory greater than yours? What God is saying is, go to what is today Syria, Kalne, and also Hamath, Syria, great cities. Did they escape judgment? He says, even go to Gaza of the, of the Philistines. He's saying, did they, as great and beautiful and powerful as those cities were, God is saying, did they escape judgment? How do you think Zion, those that are ease in Zion? This is the second group says, hey man, if we're gonna be condemned, let's just do what we want. Let's eat, drink, and be merry. Let's just have a good old time. God says, go look at Kalne. Go look at Hamath. Go look at Gaza. God says, did they escape? Meaning, if they didn't escape, and when he says, are you, is your territory better than yours? Is their territory better than yours? Meaning, they didn't escape judgment, neither will you. Judgment begins at the household of God. Let me read on in uh, chapter 6. Woe to you who put far off the day of doom. See, these are those that are ease in Zion. They said, we don't care. The day of the Lord, ah, man, that's way off. Who cares? You put far off the day of doom. Who caused the seat of violence to come near. You're causing the Assyrian army that I'm sending down to. It's your fault in that you won't turn to God, you won't repent of your ways. He says, woe to you who put off the, do the day of doom. You don't think it'll ever come. You're saying, man, let's just have a good old time. Who cares? We'll deal with whatever when it comes. God says, woe to you. How does that apply to the church today? We have to be mindful of, mindful of the fact that we are God's people. 
God is not going to ignore and push under the, under the carpet, as it were, our wrongdoing. He says, are you any different from anyone else? Didn't judgment come to those great cities since you consider, and why did he say that to Zion, and, uh, which is Jerusalem, and Samaria? Why did he say that to them? Because he's saying, you think you're so great. You think you are at ease. You think you, are, you have nothing to worry about. Notice how I didn't forego judgment or punishment on those other cities which were also sitting at ease and, and great in their own eyes and in their own way. They were comfortable. They were very well-to-do. Listen to this. Here's why God got with them. Who lie on beds of ivory, stretch out your couches, eat lambs from the flock, and calves from the midst of the stall, who sing idly, I'm reading the New King James Version, who sing idly to the sound of stringed instruments and invent for yourselves musical instruments like David. He is not here comparing David's worship on the stringed instruments to theirs. Theirs was for evil. David's was for good, to the glory and honor of God. He's saying, but your genius and your creativity is a lot like David's where you, like David, created such beautiful stringed instruments, you're sitting back and relaxing and having banquets and just enjoying and living a sinful life, and you're saying there are no consequences. Let us just ease in Zion. Let us ease in Samaria. Let us just have a good old time. Who cares about the consequences? God says you're laying on a bit of ivory and you're eating the best of meats. And God says you've made musical instruments instruments for yourselves and you sing songs and you're very ingenious with your creating your instruments so much you're similar to David the way David created many instruments stringed instruments that was a big thing to have stringed instruments to make music back then he says and have invented for yourselves musical instruments like David who drink wine from bowls those bowls were usually used for sacrifices he's saying you're using them just to party down Another thing, it shows how wealthy they are because they're not drinking out of sheepskins, they're drinking out of bowls. God is also, look at how rich you are. And you're taking it all for granted. And you're saying, we're at ease in Zion. We're at ease in Samaria. We're having a good old time. Who cares about uh, the punishment that God may be bringing? God says, you've said in your mind, the day of doom, verse 3, is far off of chapter 6. You, you, it's far off, yet you're bringing punishment on yourselves. When I send an Assyrian army in 722 B.C. and take you into captivity, they conquered Syria earlier, and then they came and conquered the northern tribes of Israel and took them into captivity, and thus the diaspora of the Jewish people. And of course, you'll remember in 586, Judah had the same punishment come to them when Nebuchadnezzar came. I don't mean to get too technical or factual with, his, with history, but you must know these things, that the Lord prophesied these things would come, and they still ignored the Lord. And the Lord was giving them full warning, straighten up your lives, turn to me. I've done this if you read chapter 4. Read, please read chapter 4. The Lord says, I've done this to you, and I've done this to you, and still you won't turn to me. And then you'd go back to chapters, the earlier chapters, where he says, and I've blessed you, and I've brought you out of Egypt, and I've given you holy men, and you tell them, don't prophesy here. The Lord said, what must I do to get your attention? So the Lord, through his word today, is telling us, don't be like these. Those that ease into two groups of people, first of all, the religiously hypocritical, those who come and worship and aren't sincere, make no effort, make no effort to become more like the Lord, and then those who just take it easy and say, whatever, man, whatever happens, happens. Let's just make the most of this life. That's all that it, there really is anyway. So let's just eat, drink, and have a good old time. And if doom comes, first of all, God's not coming for a long time. If it does come, we'll deal with that then. And you'll see the two different groups addressed, first of all, in chapter 5 of Amos, 18 through 27. You can read it all yourself. I stopped at 24, I believe. Yes, you can read it on down to 27. Then he picks up on the second kind of group that he's addressing today, those who just shrug it off and say, it's no big deal. Let's just ease. Let's take it easy and have a good old time. God says, if you keep on like that, when the day of the Lord does come, it won't be a good day for you. It won't be light but dark. And you better be careful. Whoa, judgment to those of you who say you're sick of the way the world is today, but you make no change in your own lives to show your appreciation for God and what he's done for you. Let us today reach out to the Lord. And let, let me just say by way of uh, jumping ahead, I'm not going to finish the whole book, but the Lord does end up, as he usually does, with some sort of blessing in there. So in chapter 9, you'll see towards the end when he speaks of the millennial kingdom and his restoration of Israel. 
He does, in fact, say, but I will, for those of you that do turn, when I rebuild the tabernacle of David, meaning when Jesus comes, the millennial kingdom. And he says, when the Lord always leaves hope, that there is hope for those who are willing to turn and change, and hope is coming for my people. But right now, his people were so wicked that the Lord was pronouncing the judgment that was yet to come on the northern kingdom, Israel, which came in 722 BC by the Assyrian army, and then the judgment that came on the southern kingdom of Judah in 586 BC by Nebuchadnezzar. The Lord is saying, and let's appropriate this to us today, the Lord is saying, don't ignore my blessings and don't ignore my hardships that I allow you to go through. They're all to get you to turn to me. That's the whole message of God. I am fair in saving, I'm not prejudiced, I'm not partial, I'm impartial. When I save, I'll save anyone. Also though, when I punish and when I correct, I will correct all beginning, let the punishment of the correction begin at the household of God. God says, don't think because you're my people, you will escape my correction. So we are to learn today from this message, and there's much more to be said in Amos, though this is the basic overview. Don't ignore the blessings of God. Don't ignore the correction of God. But what, what, what should you do? Get right with God. Turn to God today. And for those of us who are going through hardships now, consider and remember Israel. God loved them too. Remember in chapter 3 of Amos, he said, only you have I known. I came to you out of all on the earth. Those who are in the church today, we're the ones in Christ. We're the ones saved. When are we going to turn, as it were, from whatever sinful ways we have, and again, turn, repent, rethink, turn to the Lord, and let our behavior manifest that we know we're his people, that judgment does not come on us as it did on these in the days of old. Let us remember this. God is impartial. In saving, yes, Peter made that very clear, but he's also impartial when it comes to judgment. Uh, let me go out with the expression of the old folks. Get right with God and do it now. God bless you one and all. Peace be unto you. Lord willing, I'll talk to you soon. Be well, stay safe. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, God bless you one and all. Peace be unto you. Thank you.